Hello all, my name is Brennan Brunswick, for uh, the few of you who might not know that. <laughs> and I'm going to be talking about the senior research project that I did here as a geology major. Um, and what I did is I worked with William Shandonia, a master's student from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. And we mapped, we geologically mapped the mountains near Canaraville. So this little uh, box of strange colors is the area that we mapped. And um, for reference, there's Cedar City. This is Canaraville. Canaraville is about 15 miles or so south of Cedar City. And let's see, how's this thing work? I haven't actually played with one of these things before. Somebody hit the next button. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what a triangle zone is, is um, basically it has, um, it has these four thrusts dipping this way. It has a floor thrust like this, and it has a back thrust here. And all those definitions are listed up there if you're just dying to know what they mean. But I'm going to try and explain that to you within the context, rather. So the severe orogeny is what caused this deformation that made what might be this triangle zone near Canaraville. The severe orogeny is a mountain building event that happened around 100 million years ago. And during this orogeny, there was compression happening from the west coast of North America. And when you have that kind of compression on a continent, it can break up the crust and cause faults. So initially, the faults would have happened closer to the west coast. This is one of the first faults that would have formed. And it would have allowed rock to be displaced and put up on top of other rock. And as this rock was set on top of that fault, this created excess weight and excess friction on that fault. So it was more difficult to continue the movement along that fault. Another fault would form up closer into the continent and more rock would be displaced, set on top of this fault, increase the weight, increase the friction, and so on for, so forth. So you get a series of these four thrusts. Um, let's see. So, oh, that was backwards. Oh, I have the remote backwards. Maybe that's the problem. There we go. So at the leading edge of this thrust belt, you don't have to have these four thrusts every single time. At some point, you can have a back thrust instead. So that's what this is. You can see there's a four thrust going up. It doesn't quite make it to the surface. Instead, it intersects this back thrust. And when you get that kind of shape going on, it makes this wedge shape. And when you have compression coming in, it pushes that wedge into the crust, almost like a chisel. It's like if you were to grab a chisel and push it in throughout the crust. So that created this kind of deformation where you have this series of four thrusts that's dipping in to this back thrust right there. That back thrust has now been angled up quite significantly. There's a lot of dip on the units above that back thrust. So, oh, that's backwards again. I keep holding this thing backwards. So here's a real life example of one of these triangle zones. This is the same triangle zone feature that we're trying to find near Canaraville. Um, this is up in Montana in the Sun River Canyon. And um, so clearly these things are quite massive structures. It extends all the way from Utah to Montana and beyond that. Um, this map over here, this is a geologic map. So this shows uh, all these different colors, they're, they're just different geologic units. All these purple colors that are repeating over and over again, those are the same units that have been thrust up to the surface over and over again, like I was talking about earlier. If you look at this, this is an aerial image of what that map is showing, and you can see all of these different ridges like that. These ridges are all the same unit, just like that purple unit that have been thrust up to the surface. And between these ridges in the, in the valleys, that's where those thrust faults are. And um, real fast, the principle, principle of original horizontality, that's a really important principle within geology that basically states that rocks are initially deposited horizontally. So when you're seeing units that are dipping like that into the ground, like in that aerial image, you know that they weren't deposited like that. They were deformed in some way in order to make that happen. So why does any of this matter? Well, first of all, it's science. And science is good. It's good to study things just to know it, right? But uh, it is also economically important. So for oil and gas geologists, um, these triangle zones can store oil and gas. So I'm not going to go too into detail on the oil and gas talk, but um, at some point in the lifespan of oil and gas, it's trapped within this source rock. And it can escape from that source rock, and if there's a permeable unit above the source rock, permeable basically meaning that fluids can migrate throughout the rock, then the oil will get into that permeable unit and migrate around. If there's an impermeable rock above that, 
then this will guide the migration of that oil. And if one of these faults within the triangle zone has created another impermeable unit, then you get this triangular shape that guides the migration of oil to the tip of this triangle, and it can become uh, concentrated in valuable concentrations. Um, the, we're not studying the triangle zone here to look for oil and gas. The reason that we're looking at this is that most triangle zones are only studied from seismic data, which is very coarse. It's not easy to see fine detail in these data. Um, but Canaraville has been thrust up to the surface, and rivers have eroded through it and exposed the insides of this potential triangle zone. So geologists who do want to understand triangle zones for the economic benefits of it can walk around in it, touch the rocks, you know, fill them, see all the little tiny faults, pull out their little hand lens, something that you can't do with seismic data. So it can be valuable for them. So what did we do about it? Well, me and William spent three weeks basically hiking and field mapping um, in the area near Canaraville. This is a picture from one of the places that we hiked up to. Uh, mostly I'm just showing it to you because it's pretty. I'm not much of a photographer, but you know, you take what you can get, right? Uh, this spot right here, this rock, is what we were thinking was the back thrust. That's part of why we hiked up there. Uh, these rocks over here are part of those, what we were hoping were four thrusts. You can see them dipping into the ground like this, many different units dipping into the ground. Finally, I'm pushing this right button there. So some of the information that we were looking for was paleontology and sedimentology. So for paleontology, as an example, uh, you can't always identify units easily. And when you're mapping geologically, you need to be able to identify these units. So if you can find unique fossil assemblages within these units, and that can help you to do that identification. So this right here is a picture of a gastropod, kind of like a twisted up snail. It might be a little bit hard to see, but it's basically, if you follow my laser there, like that kind of shape. Yeah, that's a gastropod. Uh, that helped us to identify one of the units. We looked for sedimentology information. So for instance, um, if you look at beaches and in rivers, you can see ripple marks forming. And those can actually be preserved even in rocks 200 million years old like these ones. Uh, this right here shows more specifically soul marks of asymmetrical ripples, which basically told us that this rock uh, had been thrusted it was initially horizontal, right, principle of original horizontality, but it was thrusted and deformed so much that it was almost completely uplifted. And that comes back later. Oh, now I'm hitting the wrong button again. So we look for structural geology information. We look for fa uh, faults and folds and a variety of other things. This is the Springdale um, member of the Kayenta Formation. And you can see there's kind of these little layers, these little lines running through it. Those are laminations. And they get truncated in this shadowy region right there. And then to the side of that, this isn't the best image, but there's more laminations running down. So rocks aren't initially deposited like that. Something had to deform it to make it look like that. And that was a fault. So we took GPS data, and we measured where we were um, while we were mapping, and we used uh, contour maps out in the field to basically look at the rocks and try and create a mental contour map of what we were seeing and trace it down onto our maps. And then I scanned uh, my field maps into a GIS program called ArcMap. Basically what GIS is, is it's a series of programs that manipulate spatial information, and it can do a wide variety of things. But the reason that I needed it most particularly for this project is because I needed to make a map, and it makes excellent maps. So I took my field map, and I uploaded aerial imagery so that I could verify that everything that I'd drawn in my field map was actually lining up right with what we see in the aerial imagery. And then you know, I finalized it, put all the lines in, put all the symbols in, and came up with this map here on the left. So it's kind of a rough draft at this point. This project is in progress. But there's quite a variety of symbols on there. Um, geological information is contained within these geologic maps. For instance, um, it's a little bit hard to see at this scale, but this line right here shows uh, a major fold that's at the, at the back thrust that we were looking at. And there's a variety of other faults in there. One of, the, one of them that I showed you is right there, that orange unit. Um, so we were mapping to gather data so we could see if there's a triangle zone here. But there had already been a map done. Uh, part of the problem is that this map was done at an entirely different scale than what we were mapping at. This is the entire map that had already been done, and we were basically just mapping that little portion right there. So we were trying to increase the accuracy and precision of this map, which turned out to be quite difficult. Um, but 
the next step would be to take the information that we did and put it into a cross section. I should have explained that earlier. A cross section basically takes what's at the surface and it projects it down into the ground to see what does the insides of the earth look like. So this is a cross section by um, Beacon, uh, let's see, what's her name? Beacon Hyden, um, the same people that did that map. And it's done at a different scale, like I said. So there's some questions as to whether this is entirely accurate at the scale that we're trying to look at. And the next step for me would be to make uh, my own cross section at a much higher resolution and try and see if there really is a triangle zone there. But some things that we can infer from this cross section, or um, maybe critique, is these overturned units. So I talked about the evidence for overturned units before, and right here you can see that these units have been overturned like that. Um, if you try and compare the top figure, the cross section of this area, to the more idealized triangle zone down here, there's a couple of differences, and you can look at that for yourself and make your own decisions. But in here, you have these forward dipping faults, and they're not in overturned units. Here we have overturned units, and he's not showing as many faults as there are, but that's a problem for me. Another thing is that I was expecting to find a major back thrust right there going way into the ground, but he hasn't uh, put that in his cross section, and that's something that we're going to try and look for in the future. But as you can see in the more ideal triangle zone, there is one of these back thrusts. And while we were doing this research, we saw what might actually be the back thrust and thus the back of this triangle zone at the entrance of the canyon instead. So that's kind of how science goes sometimes. You know, you think you know what you're going to find. You go out there, you do all this work, you don't find it, you find something else, and you know, maybe somebody else can put all this together in their future science, and, and that's how it goes. It's just a cumulative effort by a variety of scientists. And with that, do we have any questions? How much time do we have, by the way? Three minutes, perfect. Yeah, any questions? You got one? No? <laughs> All right, if there's no questions, then I guess we'll call it good. <laughs>